Psalm chapter 39. So you may bear with me. I'm uh, trying a new form of, uh, uh, of message here. I'm not handwriting this one. I've actually had it typed, so it's a little different format, so I'm trying to get used to. Pray about that. That doesn't confuse me. Uh, Psalm 39. We're looking at the whole chapter this, this morning. This psalm, the title of the message this morning, is Three Lessons in Chastisement. Three lessons in chastisement. Now this psalm of David was penned. Was penned, no doubt, during a time of either great sickness or great conviction of sin before God. But either way, we know this, that in this psalm you're going to see that he is pressed. That the hand of God is pressed on him that he is heavily chastened, and he felt this deeply. And I, I believe that, these, that this psalm that went before surely describes his condition, his condition as he wrote this psalm. Look at Psalm 38 and verse 1. It says, he says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thy wrath, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. For thine arrows sink fast in me, and thy hand presseth sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head, and in heavy burden they are too heavy for me. Every believer by reading these words can quickly identify with David's experience we can quickly identify that though we have been given a new nature, a new man created after true holiness, that neither desires any sin, but only righteousness. To do those things that please God, yet we are always confronted with the old man of sin. We are always confronted with this principle, this law, this nature that is in our mind, the old man warring against the law of Christ, which is faith and love for him who died in our stead. These two are constantly at struggle, and we are often brought to see the old, vile nature flood our hearts and souls. David said, my heavy, my iniquities are gone over my head. It is though a tidal wave had come in of sin and overwhelmed him. And flooded his heart. It flooded his mind. We too often have this. Come over us. Our sin and our uncleanness and iniquity goes over our head. We are again exposed to see what we really are. Sinners. Sinners. We are exposed to see the grotesque and hideous nature of our flesh. So when God in love chastens us because of our sin, we feel the arrows of His grace. You see, God shoots these arrows not in vengeance, but in grace. He chastens us. These arrows are meant not to destroy us, but rather to chasten us. To discipline us. These arrows stick fast in us and we remember the stench of our corruption for this purpose. That we would return to Him. Our Father chastens us for this distinct purpose. That you should forsake your sin and turn to Him. Believer, are you troubled with sin? This is a rhetorical question. <laughs> this is, we know this is, this is constant. Are you troubled with sin? 
Does God's arrows sink deep into your heart? Does His hand press hard upon you because of your iniquity? Look at verse 6 of, of 38. David said, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. My loins are filled with a loathsome disease. And there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared by reason of my disquietness of my heart. Anybody got any experience with that? If you're a believer in Christ, you do. You understand exactly what he feels. What he knows. And believer, when we find our souls so chastened and afflicted, I want you to understand the first instinct usually of ours is wrong. Usually the chastisement is meant to draw us back to God sometimes leads us further into sin. We are so prone to great sins. And what is the first sin that comes to mind when you are chastened? Murmur. <laughs> To complain. I like that. I have it pinned in my office. Let me not talk of the sovereignty of God and then complain of my lot in life. That is inconsistent. Matter of fact, it's nothing more than idolatry and covetousness. To murmur against God's chastening hand. But yet it is our first instinct. It is the first instinct of the flesh. Why me? Why me? Why not you? <laughs> Do you deserve anything better? I'm sure we deserve worse than what we had. The scripture says this, The lot is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is where? In the hand of God. So why is it that you are where you are? Why is it that you being chastened, you being afflicted because of your sin, what is the purpose? Who's doing it? God is doing it. God is doing it. One man wrote this, We are so prone to look at the stick that hits us rather than the hand that wields it. As an axe could not cut anything without the hand, so can nothing touch the elect except God purpose it. Are you afflicted? Are you sick? Are you troubled? Who's doing it? Who's doing it? Shall not there be evil in the city? And the Lord hath not done it. Who's doing it? Why are you afflicted? Why are you tormented? Why are you persecuted? Why is your life a mess? Well, we know the root cause is your sin... But we know this, the ultimate cause is God. God is doing all things, all things after the counsel of His own will. And to murmur against our providence is to murmur against the hand that wields providence. That's the first sin that we are so prone to when we murmur. Are you chastened of the Lord? Let not your heart despise it, nor let it be confounded or confused. Believer, let us not be doubtful of our Father's love or question His omnipotent wisdom. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, the Apostle speaks concerning chastisement. Matter of fact, the necessity of it. The necessity of it. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5, it says this, Have you forgotten? We're, we're prone to forget. Matter of fact, that psalm in, verse thir in, uh, in ver chapter 38 is a psalm of remembrance. Have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? The exhortation which speaketh unto us is unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Why? For the Lord loveth, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son he receiveth. Are you chastened of the hand of the Lord? You should not be confounded. Why? Because He only chastens sons. Good news. Even in chastisement. That's a great lesson, isn't it? That we should learn. Chastisement is only meant for sons. Why is the world so happy 
Why are they in their sin? They're so free. They seem without bands. Isn't that what the, the psalmist said in Psalm 73, Asaph? He said, you know, I envied the world. There's no bands in their death. Their, their mouth is wide open and they just say things. They're bold in everything they do. Why? They're not sons. They're not sons. God chasteneth his sons and scourgeth everyone he receiveth. Are you chastened? Is that good or bad? Is your chastisement good or bad? It's good. It's good. I know chastening at times doesn't seem pleasant. God never says to enjoy the enjoy enjoy the the the, the actual event of chastisement. It's unpleasant. No chastening at the time seems pleasant. But what is what is the the it's it's not the chastisement but rather the end. The Lord is working to an end. Chastisement has a reason that it yield peaceable fruit unto righteousness. Only his children are made to feel then the arrows of his grace. Remember, his only sons who are, who are made to be pressed down, made to bow down before God over our sins. Believer, what are these arrows, what are these instruments that God uses us to bring us low? When God is chastening you, what really brings you low? Well, I know this. The law makes us feel guilty. There's no doubt about that. that our guilt overwhelms us. But what is it that really sticks deep into our heart? It's not the law because usually we look at the law and we can, we can sear our conscience when it comes to matters of law. We look at it, and it's really bad, and then we look at it again, it's not so bad, and we look at it again, it's not. What really hurts? Is it not the love? Is it not His pursuing love that causes that arrow to stick deep into our hearts? It is. It's His grace. It's His grace and love that afflicts us. Why do we not want to sin? Because of His love, because of His grace. Because of his son. When we sin against God, it's not the law that torments us, but rather the love and grace that is found in Christ that moves us to weep over our sins. When we are overwhelmed in our sin and rebellion, it is then that God looks at us. You remember when Peter sinned and denied the Lord three times. It says this in Luke. Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately when he spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked. Is it not the look? Of our master it causes us great shame when we sin it's not a look of condemnation but a look of love and mercy and Peter went out and wept bitterly believer is not the love of God in Christ the cause of, uh, for us to lament over our sins is this love is only seen in the eyes of Christ who in love bore our sins in his own body on the tree. It was Jesus who suffered the full measure of God's wrath. And it's in this sorrow for sin that so often leads believers to what David does now in this text. Now, we see David's chastened of the Lord. We see he's afflicted of by his sin. We see the arrows of God sinking deep into David's heart. And he, instead of murmuring now, he's, he's over that. What is he doing? Now look what he does. He, he la leads him to this other sin. He said, he said, I said, in his chastisement, in his grief, he said, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. 
I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow stirred. David here under the chastisement of, and lamenting over his sin and rebellious, over his sickness and circumstance, he determines to do something. He determines to do something. He determines not to sin. Then we're going to see another division. That's not going to be my first division. The first, second one is verses 3 through 6. David learns something. He has a revelation given to him by God. This, this uh, determination will fail. <laughs> and then he turns to God and he asks for, for a lesson to teach. And God reveals something to him. He reveals this. His, the frailty of his flesh and the vanity of his nature. And then the third thing, David not, doesn't make a determination. He just makes a declaration. What is his declaration? Hope in God and prayer. He said, I determined to hope in God and to pray. <laughs> so these are the three things, I, the lessons that I want you to learn in chastisement. I pray the Lord will help us. First, look at this determination. David says, I will take heed to my ways. I will keep my mouth as a bridle. What I want you to see first is the goodness and sincerity of David, David's determination. Is there anything, can you find anything wrong with his determination? Can you find anything wrong with it? Surely every believer, especially one who is afflicted because of his sin, is it not right then to determine not to sin? If we are afflicted by our sins because of our murmurings and complainings, surely it is a good thing for us to determine to keep from sin. You remember Jesus told that woman taken in adultery, what did he say? Go and sin no more. Good determination. That's a good, good thing. Should not sin. John says, little children, I write you, write you, to, these, you to these things that you sin not. I know this is what I said before is the longing of our heart, isn't it? To not sin. That's the longing of the new nature, to not sin. Matter of fact, believer, we are commanded by the revealed will of God to flee from sin, avoid sin, and mortify sin. Is that not right? Paul says this, flee fornication. And that, isn't that just a good command? Isn't that a good thing to exhort one to flee from sin? You know, I remember uh, Augustine had uh, very great difficulty with the lust of his flesh. And he had to run one time. He, had, he got into a place and he was tempted to sin. He had to actually take off. Good. If you're in a situation, believer, where your sin is temptation, run, flee, get out, avoid it. He said, avoid foolish questions, genealogies. You know, when, isn't that in, interesting to us? We want to, somebody has all these questions, these high thought. Avoid them. Run away from them. <laughs> don't, don't engage with them. They're just, they're just seeking uh, uh, some kind of glory for themselves. Avoid them. Avoid foolish questions, genealogies which strife. And in Colossians 3, he said, mortify your members which are upon the earth. So these are good things, right? To determine not to sin is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with his determination. Matter of fact, God reveals that we should. What then is the problem with David's uh, determination? Look at this. I said two words. I will. <laughs> there it is. There's the problem. There's the root of his failure right there. I will. Well, let's get our watches out and see how long this lasts. I determine within my own self, within my own strength, that I will not sin again. Anybody said that? Now, I, I don't want you to raise your hand because you might get embarrassed, but everybody I know in this whole room said it. I'm done with that. I've done it. I'm finished. That is it. No more. And then, sure enough, 
you right back where you started. Why? You did it. You did it. I will. I will keep my ways. I will bridle my tongue. Listen, believe me, you could pluck your eyes out of your head, cut off your hands and cut off your feet, and your, the eyes of your mind will still lust. The hands of your mind will still reach for sin. The feet of your mind will still run as quickly as it can to sin. Notice in verse 2, David was able to do this, at least in his own mind, for a short period of time. And so we may too keep up this outwardly, right? You may, you may keep it up outwardly. You may really just grit your teeth and determine not to do something. And you may for a time, oh, until you feel good about it. And when you feel good about it, then, then you just let yourself go a little bit more and more. David was able to do this for a time. He may keep up appearances. We like David, when you keep something in, it only grows worse. Somebody once said, if you put a tiger in a cage, he's still a tiger. If you put up a fire inside a contained area, pretty soon it'll explode. And that's what happens when man tries to keep sin in his own strength and push it down, push it down pretty soon. It erupts. It erupts. What did David say? Look at this. He said, my sorrow was stirred. <laughs> it didn't make things better. His sorrow was stirred. And look at this. He said, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then it exploded. That thing I determined to do, sure enough, I did it. I did it. Believer, if you grieve with your sin, is the hand of the Lord heavy upon you? Do you desire to keep yourself from your complaint? Do you desire to keep yourself from sin? Listen, with you it is impossible. You won't do it. You won't do it. You cannot do it. You desire to keep yourself from sin, but you will not do it in your own grief. You cannot cure yourself. And you will not, God will not allow you to comfort yourself with your resolutions and determinations. Do not keep the pain of sin. Or else it will explode into sorrow and grief. Yet when we by our determinations only fail to cure ourselves by the power of our flesh, the end is always the same. Failure, 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 failure. This is a lesson that we must learn in chastisement. Because that's exactly what we try to do when God chastens us. We says, I won't do it again. Well, in your own strength, you will. You will. But notice this ver next second thing, a divine revelation. Verse 4 through 6. David could not hold his tongue, and he cried unto the Lord, Lord, make me to know my end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily man at his best state is altogether vanity. Vanity. Now David desires to know of the Lord the brevity of his life, the frailty of his nature. Surely, we would not make such foolish resolutions to keep ourselves in our own strength if we had a better understanding of who we are. 
You wouldn't try it if you knew really who you were. Lord, help me to know who I am so I will not do that. I will not make these vain determinations in my own strength. Let me know. And so David learns something in this prayer. First of all, he learns the days, the shortness and brevity of his life. And secondly, he learns that man is at his best state altogether vanity. Believer, may God teach us to number our days. Why? That we may incline our hearts to wisdom. Your life is so short. Your life is just, as, just a breath. You take a man and two friends and they're in their young age and one dies and the other lives to be old. When he gets to the point of death, what will he say? He'll say that that span between him and his friend is nothing. Nothing. It was a brief moment, a brief time. You that are older, is that not so? Is your life not been a, a breath, just a, a hand breath? It is nothing to an infinite God. Our life is but a span. And that's it. It's nothing. Lord, teach us this. Why? So that we may set our eyes on Christ. That we may set our affection on Christ. And not on ourselves. Not relying in our own strength. But looking to Christ. And when we look to Him, it is only by looking to Him that we are able to move from sin. Is only by keeping our affection and love toward Him that sin is put away. Scripture says, All flesh is grass, and the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth away. So what do we hold on to? But the word of the Lord endureth forever. What do you hold on to? I want to hold on to that which endures forever. I want to hold on to that thing that is going to last longer than I am. It is the gospel. It is Christ. Hold fast to Christ. Look to Christ. Follow Christ. Obey Christ. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If we, set, if we have our affection on Christ and our eyes are on Christ, our eyes are not on the sin. They're not on the lust. They're on Christ. And the moment you take your eyes off Christ, what are you doing? You're sinking again. Look to Christ. May God teach us then to look to Christ. And then when we do, what do we learn? We learn this. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That if I were capable of not sinning from this point forward, how much would that help me to God? Not one bit. Why? Because Christ is all my righteousness. Christ is all my sanctification. Christ is all my wisdom. Christ is my redemption. Christ is my love, my joy, my peace. He's everything to me. And what am I? Vanity. Here today, gone tomorrow. Do you realize this? That in a hundred years, no one will even know we were here. They won't even know. We'll be a picture in an album somewhere. Who's that? I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's grandma somewhere. Why are you so concerned about it then? What are you so wrapped up with the things of the world for? Let them go. Follow Christ. Obey Christ. Believe Christ. Trust Christ. Why? Your vanity. Nothing. Nothing. Where then shall the chastened sinner go? Seeing then we cannot determine to keep ourselves from sin, seeing that our life is but a handbreadth, that our, our best state is altogether vanity, where then does the chastened sinner turn for joy, hope, and peace? Most surely we can't run to our determination. But look where David turns. 
in the greatest time of his grief and sorrow. Go to Psalm 51. Remember, this is his greatest grief, was when he had committed that great sin with Bathsheba and murdered her husband. And the Lord sent his prophet to reveal to him his sin. In Psalm 51, and look at verse 4. He cries against thee, and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. What did he learn? His vanity. Vanity. Behold, thou desirest truth on the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make known to me Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Look at his cry. Purge me with hyssop. That's that branch that they use to sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat. Hyssop. Purge me with the blood of Christ. Cleanse me from my sins. And, and what? I shall be clean. I shall be washed. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. If I am washed in his blood, my sins will be white. They'll be gone forever. Cleansed. Make me to hear joy and gladness. What is joy and gladness that we hear? Is it not the gospel? The joy and gladness of Christ. The joy that's found in Him and His gospel. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Notice he didn't say to restore the joy of my salvation, thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. This is where the believer turns, seeing his vanity. And David then makes a declaration. Look at this in your, te in your uh, text in Psalm 39. He says this in verse 7. And now, Lord, what wait I for? <laughs> Seeing that I ain't, got, I ain't got much time, what am I waiting for? What am I waiting for? Seeing I am altogether vanity and cannot keep myself from sin, what am I waiting for? I will hope in you. There's a declaration, not a determination, declaration. There's my hope. There's my hope. What is my confidence that I shall see God and live forever? You won't see it in me. You'll see it in my hope. The Lord is my hope. My hope. David here declares it. He declares the truth that his hope is not in himself or his determination, which is vanity, but rather his confidence of salvation is in God. This he should have done first. Any, any doubt of that? That he should have done that first? <laughs> in his chastisement, should we not skip the other two and just say, my hope is in God? My confidence is in Him. God has to bring us through this. You have to learn the other two before you're going to do the other. That's just what God does. Believer, you should loathe your sin, and yes, you should flee from it, avoid it, and mortify it. But never attempt to do it in your own power, but rather by looking to faith in Christ. That's it. Simple. Gospel's not complicated. Don't make it into a law of rules and regulation. It is simple. If you desire to flee from sin, look to Christ, and you won't do it. If you're looking at Christ, if you're holding to Christ, if you're fleeing to Christ, you won't. Now, Martin Luther said this. He said, I can't stop the birds from flocking but I can stop them from nesting you won't stop the feeling of sin coming up but surely we can avoid it and flee from it how? by looking to Christ by entering into the things of God trusting in Him in His strength why? because in weakness is His strength made what? manifest, perfect his strength is perfect to keep you. Chastened and weary believer, what are you waiting for? Hope now in God. Set all your hope, all your strength. I have no strength in myself. Lord, you are my strength. 
Can you find a stronger source to keep you from sin? Anything less than the power of God is too weak. Anything less than the power of God is too weak. Won't do it. Determine then to hope in God. For Christ has delivered. Look at this. He said, you're my hope because deliver me from my transgression. Listen, Christ has delivered you from the penalty of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why? He put it away by his one sacrifice. Scripture says that he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified by his one offering. He has delivered you from the power of sin. Do you realize that? That you are delivered from the very power of sin in that you have a new nature? In that the Holy Spirit of God himself dwells in you? Is that not enough power? Yes. Strength, power is from Him. See, it's not a cooperative effort, though. <laughs> it's all Him. It's all Him. It's laying prostrate at His feet. You know, my greatest picture of this is when the, the uh, I believe it was Hezekiah, when he was surrounded by those Assyrians. You remember what he did with those letters? The letters told him, you don't trust in your God. We're going to come and we're going to destroy you just like I did every other kingdom. What did he do? Did he raise an army? Did he sharpen his spear? He set himself in battle array against the enemy? No. He spread the letters before the Lord. That's a good thing to do. Take yourself and your vanity and spread it out. And lay there until God answers. What else are you going to do? Determination fails. Absolute surrender is the only option. And it's a good option. <laughs> Why? Because he delivers us from the power of sin. And you know, one day, he's going to deliver me from the very presence of sin. This is my hope, my confidence that one day I won't have to deal with this anymore. When? Soon. Remember, I'm only a hand breath. That's it. And I won't have to deal with this anymore. Good hope. A good hope. And this good hope leads us to prayer. Look at that, David. He says this, um, Look at verse 12. He said, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears, for I am a stranger with thee and a sojourner as all my fathers were. You see, he takes his place with Christ. Christ was a stranger here. And you listen, when you don't run in excess with others, you'll be a stranger. You won't be... People won't know what, how to deal with you. You're... Oh, spare me that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. He's praying for healing. He's being chastened by sickness or whatever, and he prays for healing. I tell you, when a man's chastened, is not our whole body affected? Our mind, our body is weak. We become sickly. Chastisement is a real thing. And what is the remedy? Hope in Christ. Faith in Christ. Obedience to Christ. Love to Christ. May God bless us even in the midst of our chastisement. Teach us. Instruct us. Forsake our vain determinations, know our vanity, and hope in God. Three lessons in chastisement. God bless it. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer.